Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. And uh, we'll start in verse 35. And I want to continue the theme somewhat. Well, it, is the, it will be a continuation, but with a little different perspective, and that is the harvest and the laborers and that that we talked about this morning. So in verse 35 of Matthew chapter 9, we'll read from there to the end of the chapter, verse 38. The Bible says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness every di- and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. And then verse 38, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he, will, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And let's pray. Our Father God, thank you again, Lord, that we can be here. We thank you for the freedom to be able to uh, preach and to be able to meet and not have to uh, fear any kind of retribution. And we just pray, Father, that as your word is opened and preached, that you would just uh, um, uh, put the power of the Holy Spirit upon me and use these words, Lord, to touch hearts and affect lives in the way that you would that you would uh, desire. And I pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And then just uh, quickly, I, I, I forgot, but I just quickly want to mention our church in, in Belarus. Um, it's it's um, it's doing well. Uh, we have a, we had a national pastor already in place, and so um, he is still there and he's still meeting. We don't have a big church, so there's just a handful of people that are coming. But uh, uh, Lord willing, they'll continue, and and uh, God will continue to bless them there. They have their own they have their own building. Um, another missionary uh, built the building before he was deported. And then uh, the church, and then the building was finished after he left. But uh, so they have a place to meet. They have a pastor, uh, and so um, we thank God for that. Amen. So the church can keep going, and the church uh, is um, is able to actually to be independent of any. Uh, it's it's uh, indigenous, I guess, if that's the right word. But it's in, in independent of our money, of anybody else's money, which is a which is a blessing uh, in itself. But, but now if we could just focus back on the, on the text here a little bit. Uh, we see here as we read that, that now we know that Jesus Christ came to this earth with one single purpose. And that was to save the world. And he was, was going to do that by dying on the cross uh, for the sins of the world. That by faith uh, they could be, that they could be saved. and uh, That the world could be saved. Anybody that would come would be saved. And it was this reason that in verse 35, we see that he went, he went about all the cities and villages teaching and preaching. And this is the reason that he went to all those places to fulfill that purpose, to preach the gospel of the kingdom, to preach that salvation, uh, to preach that faith in the Son of Man that would be lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness. And so he went everywhere preaching that message, and he did so tirelessly uh, every day to the point where sometimes the disciples were wore out, right? Uh, you, you can remember times when the little children came and the disciples were, go away, go away. You know, it's late. We're tired. And Jesus said, nope, let him come. He, he, he told him, he said, the, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And, and so he was tirelessly working. And the reason he did that was because of that sole purpose that he came for. And as he was doing that, Jesus trained the disciples. That their, and their task would be to continue what he started, his church and his work, once he was gone. And, and so that was part of the process, too, is the training and, and the preaching. And uh, when Jesus engaged the people, you could hear the passion. As we read it, we can see the passion that he had for the people. And that's what it says in, in verse 35. Jesus went all about the cities and villages teaching. But then in verse 36, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. And so this passion that he had came from how he viewed the people. Right. When he saw them, how he viewed them. And uh, from that passion 
came the emotional plea that we see in verses 37 and 38 about uh, the laborers being few and to pray, the harvest being great and the laborers being few and to pray for them. That, that passion of those, wor- th- those words, that emotional plea came from this passion that he had in verse number 36. And so as we, as we look at this a little bit more closely, I want you to see, first of all, in verse 36, we see his passion. We see that passion. And when, when we read that, uh, when he saw the multitudes, so his focus, his attention was on the people themselves. I mean, he didn't, when he went into those synagogues were beautiful places, right? And they, they, uh, they used some of the finest materials, the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, it, it was also a grand place with gold and silver and all of the most expensive things. And it was done up in, in the best way possible and all those things. But all of that beauty and all of that gold and all of those riches that was not, that's not what impressed the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not what gathered his attention. That's not what he was focused on. That's not what he, uh, what he came there to see, if you will. He came there because of the people. And we see that because he said he came to those cities, city by city, town by town. And when he saw the people, he was moved with compassion. When he saw the people, and, and so we see that uh, we see that passion that he had because he didn't look at now now it was a multitude. We see that in verse thirty six. It says when he saw the multitudes, but why was it? What was it that moved him with such compassion? What was it that caused him to have this compassion? Now. Um, us, us missionaries, we sometimes get into those, those bad habits. We like to give facts and numbers and this many and this percent and all that kind of stuff. And that's good because it helps us visualize a little bit. But at the same time, yes, there was, a, there was a large group. Yes, there was a multitude here. But his compassion came from the fact that he looked and saw each one as an individual. He looked at the faces of each person. Of course, he was God. And so when, when he looked upon them, he knew everything about them already. And uh, the, it's kind of hard for us to grap, grasp, that, grasp that kind of concept. But the only thing he was interested in it was in those people. It was a great multitude, but it was individual people. And that's how we have to look at things. We have to look at the mission field. We have to look at uh, places like, well, Belarus, Russia, Ukraine, all those places. Uh, Name any place around the world. Yes, they have large populations and all that stuff. But those large populations are made up of individuals. And individual souls that that are destined for eternity in only one of two places either heaven or hell. And that's what moved the Lord Jesus Christ to compassion is the fact that they didn't know. Their destiny was not yet determined. They had not made their decision yet. And so he had great compassion. And so we have to look at it that way. And uh, Ecclesiastes, I believe it says that my eye affected my heart. And the eye of the Lord Jesus looking on those people affected his heart. And so if we can think about these mission fields, these places that all these flags represent, instead of thinking them as large countries, think of them as individuals that make up a large country. And each individual has a soul. And each individual soul is going to go somewhere. And if they don't hear the gospel and they don't trust the the Lord Jesus Christ, they're not going to go to heaven. They're going to go to hell. And if we look at it that way, that they're individuals and they all need to have the opportunity to make this choice, it'll move us to compassion, just like it did the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he looked at them and he looked upon their faces. And what did he see when he looked upon their faces? He saw a fallen, a fallen uh, continence. Uh, the, you have to remember in the time of Jesus Christ, the Romans ruled that part of the world. They ruled the, the, the nation of Israel, that territory. And so they were, they were a proud people that uh, not long ago, uh, David was their king, Solomon was their king, and it was the, uh, the glory of the kingdom of Israel in those days. And, and now those proud people are serving a Roman government. 
And so, yes, they were discouraged. And so their countenance had fallen. And he saw that on their faces. He saw the hopelessness. He saw, saw the helplessness. And uh, it's, 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 it's an interesting thing. I first went to the former Soviet Union, to the country of Russia in 1999. And the thing that impressed me more than anything else was this very thing, their faces. And at, at that time, the, uh, the Russian economy had just collapsed in late 1998. And uh, people lost their pensions. People lost everything. And people were just discouraged. People were just desperate. And that's what impressed me is the fatalism that you could see on their faces. The way they walked, the way they carried themselves, you could see that they felt that there was no hope. They felt that there was nothing they could do. They felt that there was nowhere to turn. And I think that when Jesus went from town to town, city to city, looking on these people, looking on these multitudes, he saw the same thing. That helplessness, feeling like there was no, like all was lost. The Roman government controls us. Uh, we've, uh, we've waited for Messiah. Messiah hasn't come. And, and all this hopelessness. And I think Jesus saw that on his face, and, on their faces. And when he did, it moved him to compassion. And uh, he saw the hopelessness. He looked in their eyes and he could see the hopelessness. He could see in their eyes that they had no, that they had no future. And, you know, we began to see that change in Belarus. When we first came to Belarus in 2003, it was the same thing. But as this younger generation came up and grew up, there was optimism. There was youth and there was vibrance and there was energy and there was hope. And as we saw these things unfold in the last couple of years, we began to see those young people with that vibrance and that hope and and all of that begin to disappear. And on those young people, we began to see that same countenance and that same hopelessness upon their faces that uh, you know they they did what they could and and they were literally beaten into submission and you could just see in their eyes and you could just see in their faces that they felt like all hope was lost and and uh, all hope is lost outside of the Lord Jesus Christ and so Jesus knew that. And so looking upon their faces, looking in their eyes, uh, they, they saw, he saw all of that, all of that hopelessness, all of that fatalism, all of that, uh, all of that uh, dis- depression and, and, and despair. And he was moved with compassion. And folks, we need to let God move our hearts with that kind of compassion for the people uh, all around the world, but for the individuals all around the world. Look at them as individuals. And, and uh, you know, he knew each one. You know, it's interesting because everybody that he saw in his life, he knew everything about them. He knew their names. He knew their families. He knew the burdens they carried. He knew the secrets they carried. He knew everything about them. And uh, it moved him to compassion. Now, we may not know all of those things, but we know that every one of us carry our secret burdens. Every one of us carry our secret heartache, something that, uh, that we have to carry that nobody else can help us with. And uh, the Lord Jesus Christ saw that, but he also knew that they carried the greatest burden of all. What was going to happen to them in, in eternity? And uh, they needed to have the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. And so he went town to town preaching because that was his burden. That was his passion. That was what he, that was what he came to do. And so uh, we see his passion, first of all, that compassion that he had. Secondly, I want you to see the parallel that he makes. Okay, so verse 36 again, he says, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Why? Because they fainted. That's that fatalism. That's that depression. But also because they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And that's how he looked at them. He looked them as sheep that were just scattered abroad. And sheep are kind of a unique animal. If you uh, if you've ever rode horses, I don't have a lot of experience with horses, but I remember when I was a boy, we were uh, my family loved to camp. We camped every weekend, which is why I never camp anymore. But uh, but we camped every weekend, and and uh, one time we were at this campground with this uh, this horse horseback riding place right next to it, and uh, we went and we went horseback riding, and and they told us you can take the horse out anywhere you want, and said. Uh, 
if you, if you can't remember how to get back, don't worry about it. Just stop, and the horse will come back. The horse knows his way home. He'll bring you back home. You don't have to worry about it. And, uh, you know, my, my pastor, Randy King, he was a farmer, and uh, he used to tell the stories about the, the cows. You can send the cows out to pasture, but, you know, in the evening, they come back to the barn. You don't have to go round them up. They'll just come back because they know it's time to come home. And, but a sheep is not that way. A sheep won't come back. If, if nobody goes and gets it, the sheep will just wander until it dies or is killed. And so when Jesus saw the multitude, he was thinking about sheep in that way. Sheep that would never be able to find their way home. These folks were like sheep that would never be able to find their way to salvation. They would never be able to find their way to God without somebody going out there and bring them, bringing them to God and telling them, uh, and telling them this is God, this is the plan of salvation. And that was the only way they were going to know because they weren't going to get there on their own. I thank God that somebody told me because where I was and, and, and the situation I was in in my life, I would have never gotten there except for a lady that was relentless, and I do mean relentless in witnessing to me and telling me that I needed to get saved six months. And finally, uh, I got smart and, and, and got saved, but it took a long time uh, for this stubborn old guy to, to, uh, to get saved. But, uh, but they were scattered as sheep. They were scattered as sheep and uh, no way to find their way home. Um, you know, it's interesting. You may remember this, preacher. Uh, you remember Jeff Gwynn? You remember when Jeff Gwynn had those sheep on the property there? Uh, one time after school, those sheep got out. I don't know how they got out, but they got away. And he asked uh, myself and a bunch of uh, a few other guys to help him get his sheep. You know, how hard can it be to get four or five sheep, right? If only we knew. Uh, we, never would have pro- we never would have volunteered, I'll tell you that, because we went all over, we chased all over that, that back 40 beyond the bus garage there. You know where I'm talking about. We, we were all over that field trying to get those sheep, and, and they were running, we were chasing them, and, and, uh, and uh, Jeff Gwynn, he says, okay, we got to stop. We can't keep chasing them like this because they'll keep running and they'll have a heart attack and die. So they aren't even smart enough to stop and take a rest. You know, and, and uh, you know, that's like the sinner. He isn't even smart enough to know what's good and bad for him. Right. You know, and that's, that's the parallel that Jesus made with these people, that sheep scattered abroad. Yeah. And we chased those sheep and chased those sheep, and we got them into some building. And I don't even know what it was, but some little building there. We finally got a couple of them in there, and, and, and they were going crazy. Uh, and... Uh, you know, I went in there to get one. I thought, how hard can it be to get these? Well, that, that sheep was crazy. He wore me out, and I never did get it. And the only guy, you know, the only guy that could go in there and get those sheep was Jeff because he was their shepherd. They trusted him. They didn't know me. They didn't know the rest of us. We were just these guys chasing them, you know, and they were scared to death, and they were nervous, and they were jumping around, but he got them out. Even for him, it wasn't the easiest thing in the world, but he got him out because he was the shepherd. And Jesus said, the shepherd hears, uh, the sheep hear my voice and, and they follow. And, and so they were like, and that's how he saw these people, like these sheep that we chased around that field that day, trying to get them rounded up, somehow get them back in. We finally did. And uh, I don't know about the other guys, but I decided I'm never doing that again. Because that turned out to be a, a, a way, way more than I bargained for. But that just tells you about these sheep. They would have, if, if we hadn't gone and gotten them, who knows where they'd have gotten to. But they'd have kept going until A, they died, or B, they were killed. And Jesus looked out at the multitude. And he saw them as sheep that were scattered like those sheep that day that we were chasing. Sheep that would just wander aimlessly until the day came that they died and went to hell. And it moved him to compassion because of that. It moved him to compassion because they had no shepherd. They had nobody to guide them. They had nobody to lead them back. They had nobody to tell them. And, and so, in a, in a sense, you and I, the Christians, the saved, we're the shepherds. And we need to guide those lost. And those missionaries that you send in all these different countries, they're the shepherds. And they guide their sheep. 
And they bring their sheep to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And those sheep get saved. But these sheep had no such pastor. or uh, um, uh, Not pastor, but um, shepherd. They had no shepherd. They had no such leader. They had nobody to tell them, come on this way. This is the safe way. I mean, we were chasing those sheep and we were trying to, we were trying to help them. We were trying to do what's good for them. We were trying to protect them. We were trying to bring them back to safety. But they didn't know that. And you think about it, they left the place of sh- yeah. safety. The one guy, Jeff, who took care of them and fed him and did all those things for him, they ran from him. They didn't understand. And, and, and that's, the, that's what we see with people today. That's what Paul was talking about when he said instructing those that oppose themselves. People are like that. They're like those sheep. They leave the place of safety. The one guy that can help them, they're running as fast as they can somewhere else from it. And, and they need that shepherd. They need somebody to guard, guide them. And, and uh, uh, geez, that's how Jesus saw the people of that day. And I don't believe that's changed today. The lost are still that way. They're still going out. People are, you find people everywhere in this world today that have no purpose. They have no goal. They don't know where they're going. They have no purpose in life. Some of them think their purpose in life is to make a million dollars or two million dollars or a billion if they've already made a million and a trillion if they've already made a billion. That's the, they think that that's their goal in life. That's, they think that's where... And, and these people, they go everywhere and do all these things trying to fill a void in their life, trying to fill that, fill that void in their chest, that void in their heart. The only thing that can fill that void is the Lord Jesus Christ, but they don't know it. They don't know it. And I remember that's exactly what I did. For me, I chased alcohol and I chased uh, rock music and I chased uh, uh, marijuana and that that kind of stuff. Don't tell anybody, but uh, I, I chased all that stuff. And why? To fill that void in my heart. To fill that void in my heart. Then when I was 21 years old, uh, my friend's mother told me how to fill that void. Amen. Told me what that void was and who could fill it. And I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And the void was filled. And I no longer chased all that other stuff. That was just, uh, it was just, uh, it was futile. And there was never a hope of, uh, uh, of achieving anything doing it. And you can pick name A, B, C, D. People are chasing something to fill that void because they don't know how to fill that void. And the Lord Jesus Christ will do that. And so we need to go everywhere, everywhere we can. And like Pastor said today, we can't always go everywhere, but there's other people that can go there that we can help get there. And that's what missions is. And so um, the only way to fill that void is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to see people the same way that Jesus Christ saw people in this passage. And if we'll do that, if we see those people like that, uh, how often do we pass people by? You know, you go to the store, you go to work. Do you think about their eternal soul? And uh, sad to say, I I wish I could say, oh, everybody I meet, I think about their eternal soul. That's the first thing I think about. But it's not. It's not. Life gets busy and we go on and we don't think about it. But Jesus Christ... That's the first thing he thought about. He didn't get too busy for that. And, uh, you know, I realize that we're not God and we're human and it can happen. But we need to make a conscious effort to think about those individual souls, to think about their destiny. We pass them at work. We pass them in the store. Everywhere we go, do we see them like Jesus did? God help us to see them like Jesus did. If we did, it would change our life and it would change theirs. And, and so uh, we see, we see the, uh, the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see his parallel. And then uh, look at verse 37. We'll read that. It says, Then saith he unto the disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. So the third thing we see is we see his pain. We see his pain. This plenteous harvest. All these people that we've talked about here. You know, in, in the time of Jesus Christ, it's estimated, uh, from what I could tell, about 300 million people or so lived on the earth at the time of Christ. And today, there's just under 8 billion people that live there. And so, if there was a great harvest then, well, 
What does that say about today? There's a greater harvest today. And, and so it, it, the job is unfinished. The Lord started it. He started the work, but the work is unfinished. The harvest was great then, and so it's great now. How would you describe it? You know, look, looking at Jesus' words, he thought it was overwhelming. He thought it was enormous. He thought it was huge. He thought it was great. So if he thought in his day it was great, then our, we have to think the same way, that we have an enormous, daunting task to do. But, uh, and you think, how could we possibly do it? Well, you think about Paul and Barnabas and later Paul and Silas. They went all over the world. They went all over Asia. They went into Europe. And, and literally, the world of that day, they preached to, uh, uh, the, to the whole world. And the, the gospel reached was far-reaching at that time because of those men. You know, Paul and Barnabas went, and then they split, and Timothy and Barnabas went off one way, Paul and Silas another way, and it went from one to two missionary teams. And, and the gospel began to spread and, and people began to get saved and uh, they reached the world. Paul and Silas, it was said of them, or was it Bar- Barnabas and Paul, it was said of them that they turned the world upside down. Sure. They turned the world upside down. Would to God somebody would say that about some of us, yeah. about, uh, about Baptists, for example, about a missionary, about a, uh, about a group of missionaries, that they would turn the world upside down sure. and... and uh, uh, can it be done? It can be done through God. It can't be done in our own strength and our own power, but it can be done. And even if we never achieve that, we still need to do it. We still need to try, and we still need to go, because the results are not ours. They don't belong to us. They belong to God, and that's what we have to, we have to think about. And think about it. They, had, uh, uh, they didn't have modern transportation. They didn't have modern technology. Uh, they didn't have any of that stuff. Now uh, we, can, we can fly in, in, in a half a day around the world, you know, to the other side of the world and, and be there. And uh, we can communicate back and forth uh, through, uh, through any, any, any given social media uh, uh, app that you can think of. We can communicate back and forth. We can get the gospel around and, and uh, we can turn the world upside down. But we failed. See, God has given us more. And unfortunately, we're doing less with more right now. And so we need to ask God to help us to do the best we can, to do the most with what God's given us. And, you know, God doesn't ask us to do any more than what he, you know, than what he, with what he gives us. You know, and, and so, uh, but the pain came from the fact that those people were going to hell. The pain came from the fact that there were no laborers, and without the laborers, the people would go to hell. The pain came from the fact that they were eternal souls with a that that were going to a very real hell if they didn't if something didn't change their that that trajectory of life. And the only thing the Lord knew, the only thing that could do that was bodies, was people going and telling them about the gospel. And the pain was that there wasn't enough to do it. The pain was that there was nobody to do it. And so we see his pain there as he went. And, and uh, you know, I, 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 remember, um, I remember early on in my deputation, we were driving across Iowa in, in late September. And uh, at that time of the year, the corn is just beginning to turn brown. And, uh, and then in October, it'll be time to, you know, to, the, to harvest it. I was driving across uh, uh, I-80 across uh, Iowa there, and I saw that corn, and I just got to thinking about my My grandfather was a farmer, so I just got to thinking about him and uh, the times on the farm. And then I got to, got to thinking about the farmer and all the work that went into getting that corn to the place where it was that day where it was so close to harvest. I mean, early in the winter, early in the morning, in the cold, when the rest of us are still sleeping, they're getting their equipment ready. They know that they've got to plant soon. They know that they've got to disc the field and get it ready to, and get it ready to, uh, to plant. And so they're getting all their equipment together. They're lining up their seed, and they're doing all those preparations. And then the time comes, and they're able to plant, and they watch that little seed turn into what looks like a blade of grass. And that grows higher and higher. My grandfather used to always say that the corn needed to be knee-high by the 4th of July. 
and, uh, and we watched that grow and grow and grow. And as we went across there, that was six, seven, eight foot stalks of corn by that time. And uh, that farmer would watch that grow and watch that green plant turn brown, knowing that soon those ears would be full of corn and it would be time and he could reap the harvest. Yeah. He could reap all the hard work and the sweat and the preparation that he did. And then I thought about what if there was no, no laborers to bring it in? What if for some reason he couldn't get it in? Maybe his tractor's broke, his combine doesn't work, whatever it is. And he's got to sit there and watch that corn dry up and watch the wind push it to the ground and watch the snow cover it. And, and all that he did is lost. And somehow he knows that next year he's got to pick up the pieces and somehow start over. How broken hearted he would be. And I think that as we look at this passage and we see Jesus Christ make that appeal, the harvest is truly, truly plenteous, but the, har- but the laborers are few. I think that he had that same heartbreak that a farmer would feel if he couldn't get his crops in. As he watched these people, if you will, die and go off into eternity without Jesus Christ, knowing that they'd have no hope, and it, and it moved him to compassion. It was a pain that he felt. And, and uh, so we see his pain. We see the uh, parallel that he makes. We see the passion that he had. And then we see uh, in verse 38, it, it says there, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. We see his plea. We see his plea, his plea. Uh, and, and I mentioned this a little bit this morning, but notice that he didn't berate the, his disciples, his apostles. He didn't, uh, he didn't uh, chew them out because they were lazy. He didn't chew them out because they weren't focused. He didn't chew them out because they, because they weren't motivated, because they were sitting around. But he didn't say anything like that. He didn't tell them that they were bad. He told them that we need to pray for God to send labor for God to send men, for God to send somebody to them. And uh, uh, so there was no rebuke there, but there was a plea based on that compassion and that pain that he felt and the knowledge that he had of the destination of those people. And uh, he told them to pray for these laborers. We're to pray to the Father. We mentioned that this morning, so I won't go too much into that. But it's God that does the sending. It's God that does the calling. It's God that is the Lord of the harvest. And it's God's responsibility to send uh, missionaries. Um, uh, Missionaries, preachers, they're not sent by their pastors. They're not sent by their mothers. They're not sent by their fathers. They're not even sent by their own desires. They're sent by the call of God. And the call of God comes upon a man when the Holy Spirit of God moves upon that man's heart and the Holy Spirit moves upon that man's heart because somebody is praying for God to send laborers. Somebody is praying for that man, for God to use them, to do something special with them. And God moves upon that heart and, and, he, call, and uh, he calls them. Uh, they don't go in, they don't go, the missionary doesn't go uh, to see the world. That's the Navy. That's their slogan. The missionary doesn't go for that reason. They don't go to learn about new cultures. That's the responsibility of the sociologist or the anthropologist. They don't go there to to do those kind of things. They go there because God has put a burden in their heart and called them to a place and to a people. And, and, and that's their goal, and that's their, their own uh, um, illustration, and, uh, their own motivation. And you never know, you know, you never know what God will do with an individual. Yeah. You just don't know. Um, there, there's, there was a man, his name, he was a, he's, a Wel- he's a Welshman. His name was uh, Watkin Roberts. And uh, he went to India in the late 1700s when uh, India was a uh, British colony. And he went to this, uh, um, he went to this, uh, this tribe called the Mar, and uh, he preached the gospel to them, a, a people that never heard. He wasn't there very long because it wasn't legal for him to go into the tribes like that and do that preaching. And so the government actually removed him and made him leave the country. So he wasn't there long, and he left not knowing anything about uh, about uh, what did or didn't happen to those Mar people. And uh, one day. He got a visit from a guy, maybe you've heard his name, Rachunga Pataiti was his name. And he got a visit from this guy. 
And he told him how this Ratunga's grandfather had gotten saved. And his father had gotten saved. And he was saved. And he told about the churches throughout, these, uh, throughout this, uh, this, um, uh, this tribe of people. And uh, the, uh, the missionary was, uh, was taken back by it all. That, uh, that so little time, God did so much. And so you just don't know. And, and it's true when we say little is much when God is in it. Amen. And we don't know what some guy is going to do. Um, there, was a, there was a man who was a Sunday school, who, who went, a Sunday, Sunday school teacher who uh, went, to, uh, uh, went to a shoe store to buy shoes from a shoe salesman. And that shoe salesman got saved. His name was D.L. Moody. And so, now that man had no idea what God was going to do with D.L. Moody. But when you send a guy, when God sends a man somewhere, the work that he does, it's God's business. It's yeah. God's business to send. It's God's business for the results. But, uh, but the plea was for laborers because the Lord knew that if men would go, God would save men. Men right. would get saved. And so that was his plea. And if we're faithful to pray... For God to send those laborers, God will send forth those people into his harvest. If we pray, but if we pray, if we pray, like I said this morning, we must be prepared to go ourselves if God calls us. We must be prepared to be the ones that God sends if that's what, if that's what he wants. And so uh, we don't maybe pray with that intention, but if it happens, we've got to be willing. Just like, just like those that are called are willing, we need to be willing when we pray. And so there can be no doubt that people everywhere have that hopeless feeling. Sure. Even in our day, maybe especially in the times that we see now because of, uh, uh, of what happened. It's amazing this war has thrown the world, not just Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, the world into turmoil. Right. And, and, and we see the, the, the events of the last few years have given people a very fatalistic view of the future. And we must ask God for that same burden that Jesus had when he saw the multitudes and was moved with compassion. The solution to the great harvest and the few laborers, it's prayer. It's praying for God to send more, to send men and to send women. Isaiah, in in Isaiah 6, 8, and 9, he heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall we send? Who will go for us? And he said, Here am I. Send my sister. No, he said, Here am I. Send me. And that's the attitude we need to have when we pray. Here am I. Send me. He, he responded saying, I'm right here. I'm right here. And, we need, and, and if we'll pray, there'll be men that God will call and they'll say, Here am I. Here am I. Send me. So will you pray? And will you expect God to answer that prayer? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for, uh, again, this privilege that we can be here. And, and we just thank you for the word of God that is timeless and eternal. And the, the, that uh, the word of God, is, that you promise that there will be results when the word of God is preached. And I pray, Father, that uh, we could be changed today. That our attitude, our heart, our burden, our thought process would be changed today because of your word and because of uh, the example of the Lord Jesus Christ that we saw here in Matthew chapter 9. And I pray, Father, now that you, as the service comes to a close, that you'd have your will and your way in each of our lives, in my life, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as you lead. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.